And so the title of my presentation is kind of that health inspectors, which I am. I'm, I'm a health inspector in, in Alberta, in Canada. I live in Edmonton. And I sit, oh, thank you, uh, in the house, represent oil money. Um, okay, so Canada has health inspectors and we're nationally certified. And so this is my opportunity to tell you about us. We, um, we're important, but you know, this is a, a new trend. This is a trend for us. You're, you're kind of new on the scene. and. Um, and what I can do is, yeah, sure, I'm a regulator in my little province, but at the same time, I can speak to health inspectors across Canada and help them help you in a way, right? And I think that should come through in my presentation is how to do that. And uh, I met Paul Reeves, who's someone similar to me, but in the States here. Hopefully we can help our profession understand you, which should lead to a better experience for operators and owners. So we don't know, we don't know. I don't. I don't think we're getting any argument from the group that health inspectors don't know anything. <laughs> right, so. Um, the only really, I wanted to point out, if you can see where I'm pointing there, is that Alberta had a standard for sensory deprivation tanks. Uh, it was published in 1996. And uh, in 1996, I was just barely out of high school. Like, I didn't know anything about it, but the, our province had a standard for this stuff. And it was actually probably you know, decent for its time, but I've taken every step I could to get this removed from the internet. So if you're trying to find this or you have a copy of it, good for you, but I tried to take it down off Google because it doesn't really represent where I think your industry is at. Um, has anybody seen this before or aware of it? Yeah, so just because I'm from Alberta, this, this is not a live document in Alberta. We don't enforce legislation using this standard anymore, and so you should know that. Um, I think the big thing it speaks to is um, things like chlorinating your tank and you must have a five PPM of chlorine. And you know, I, I also don't want that or I think we can do better than that. So you know, I try to get our legislators in Canada not to use this as a reference. And as this trend of flotation is growing in my city and in my province and across Canada and North America, we, we do the same thing you do. We Google stuff <laughs> and we say like, what, what's going on? What resources can we get? And uh, this, I thought this was really interesting um, that uh, I think this is a float on kind of resource, right? Where you can get materials that help you kind of navigate your way through the health department because you're, you're entering pretty much an unregulated area, yet health departments seem to love you um, or hate you. I think they love you. They love to be involved with you. But I thought this was interesting because I take a lot of ownership over my profession and I, I'm heavily involved in my profession and I. When I see something like, here's some tools to help you educate the health department, I thought, you know, there's a need there um, to build some resources on my end, like on the health inspector end. Um, probably like the quintessential health inspector reference for you. Um, has anyone ever seen a movie, it goes back a few years ago, but it's called Ghostbusters. <laughs> and there's this guy named Peck, Peck, some, his last name is Peck from the EPA, and he, walks into that ghost containment unit, you know, he doesn't understand it, and he just feels like there's something bad about it, and he says, I don't care about your opinion, just shut the thing down. I feel, I feel like you might think that we're peck, right? So next time a health inspector comes to your place, just kind of mutter pecker under your voice, <laughs> and we'll, we'll know what you mean. <laughs> and honestly, I'd rather see something like this, you know, kind of a gentle call up for help than what we typically see is signs in the door saying, you know, get lost health inspector, or worse. Um, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I think what's, uh, what's valuable from this note is <laughs> we get a little bit in health, we get a little bit uh, throw the baby out with the bath water or we lose the forest for the trees because we, and flotation's a good example of that because you've got this, well, as you just heard, this potentially groundbreaking way to keep people healthy in a mental way. And health inspectors are worried about some poop particles floating around in the water. And I think, you know, as, as extreme as this might be, um, 
it's really what we have to keep in mind when you're a health inspector is, is the greater balance or the greater idea of health. So what can you do to, to kind of pick up on that resource and kind of educate the health department? Um, I think let's have a quick talk about what, what you are and what you're not. Because uh, what I do now is I inspect tattoo studios, tattooing, piercing, nail salon. And I, I would call those, and wherever you live, you probably have a standard for tattooing. Like you, to open your door to, to be a tattoo studio, you must be inspected, and here's the rules. Same with like nail salons and these services. Um, and then there's something else where you live, likely, where they've defined something called a health service. And a health service is something that is designed to like protect or promote health. Okay? So you can probably see how you're probably more like them and not the other. Now we talk about health services. They regulate some health services. You can't just do surgery on people. You must, they call those restricted activities where I come from. So not everybody can do a surgery on someone. You must be, belong to a, the College of Physicians in my province to do stuff like that. But there's this kind of open area where there's unregulated health activities going on where you live and where I live, okay? There's also unregulated personal services. Um, and these personal services, like I said, tattooing and piercing, are the, the regulated ones. There's all these things I see, and you can come ask me afterwards what all these words mean. But uh, these are like the unregulated, you go to any mall and you'll see a lot of these services. Well, maybe not suspension, but uh, <laughs> dermal rolling, there's a lot of that going on in aesthetic salons. Uh, Laser is a big one everywhere. It's generally unregulated. Uh, but this is all for like cosmetic purposes, right? Like there's no health effect to this. There's no health component to laser hair removal. You just don't want hair. Um, threading, it can go on and on. So establishing some ground here that there's some unregulated personal services and there's unregulated health services and that's okay. The reason why we regulate is to take some freedom away from the operator and say, look, for health reasons, we need to, we need to make sure you're doing it under these, under these rules. And we, the list goes on. So we've established here, we've got like regulated and unregulated personal services, which are kind of the cosmetic effects and then we've got regulated, sorry, your restricted health services and ones that are not. And I think that you're most likely here because really what you're doing is offering something that's um, for health, for health reasons, not for cosmetic reasons. I mean, your skin feels great when you come out, but it doesn't, you're not going in there for that purpose, right? So I think knowing who you are, like why would we talk about that? Your ultimate job as an owner in an, when you have an unregulated health service is to make sure that you're not hurting anybody, really. And that's, that's what health inspectors really want to know, is, is this service going to hurt somebody? And um, in my province, we call that a nuisance, but in where you live, you might call it a health hazard. But as long as, I think ultimately what you have to do to the health department is kind of prove that you're not creating a health hazard. Um, and, and that's maybe advantageous. So what else aren't you? <laughs> This is um, a swimming pool that I inspect too in, in my city called West Edmonton Mall. This is the water park in West Edmonton Mall. It's like the, one of the largest indoor water parks. So I think it's important too to separate yourself from swimming pools. So you're not, you're not personal services and you're not swimming pools and this is why. You, like no other pool, have an opportunity to make sure that every person gets a shower. I wish I could do that at this big place, but I can guarantee you all those kids just ran right in, grabbed the tube and jumped in. Um, your patrons, the people who use your pool, tend to not be the type who uh, poop in their diapers and leave it in there, right? Like you, they tend to be like, have their, have their faculties about them. And then you also get that one-on-one -on -one with every floater. And I think I've talked to a lot of you about the importance of that and how you get to say to, uh, to, to every patron, like I need you to have a shower and this is how you do it and take your clothes off and all these things you get to do. I think that's very valuable. And we don't get that in swimming. Um, that single user, I know there's multiple users in flotation, but that's rare. Single user in a pool at one time, a pool of water is different than this, right? So you're not this. Um, and of course, what's different is circulation filtration is not happening while you're floating. Um, I think the biggest thing too, like poop scares health inspectors. We call that the fecal oral route. So when you tell me you're anal about health, I'm actually kind of ticked off. <laughs> but uh, what I want to stress is, you know, have that discussion with your health department. Like, what, what are they upset about? And if they're worried about the ingestion of fecal matter, 
it's likely not going to happen. I've floated and I know if I get that water in my mouth, it's coming right back out. And I know that if I have a cut, I, I'm gonna, it's going to sting and I've got to get out and shower it. Um, it's not going to get in my eyes or, you know, I know this, this is in your favor. You know, this is why you're not swimming. It's because you get all this, these safety factors already built in. So um, we talked about that in the workshop and I can kind of formulate kind of why you're not a swimming pool. You know you're not a pool. Um, and I think you need to really be clear on that distinction or else you're going to get lumped in with pools. Um, so what else can you tell the health department? I think just generally, and I've seen a lot of great designs out there. The other thing about my presentation, I'm sorry, I've only seen like four studios in my whole life. So I haven't seen every pod and tank and room and cabin. And so the pictures I'm showing are not meant to show anything bad necessarily, just, just so you don't have to read words all the time. But um, really the basics of your system are gonna be you know, the pump through a filter and this flow of water inlets and, out, and an, some sort of outlet taking it back to the pump. You know, you should have those basic components, and you all do. Um, and where I come from, we don't really say it must be done. Like, you can have these kind of home put together jobs, but, or you could have something a little more formal. But there's some of the things that you know, we talked about in the workshop, little tiny things that like, like do it better every time you make a new version of your pod. I've seen some of the, maybe some tubing clogs up. So what can you do to, to fix that? And I've already heard some really good advances on that. Um, putting your chemical in after the filter, not before, will get you more results in terms of killing germs. So I'm just going to fly through some of this stuff because, uh, you know, but from when I did this to now, from what I see is out there, things have really improved. I want to talk a bit about turnovers. I know turnovers came up and it drives people crazy, but turnovers are really meant to be how much time does it take for all that water in your pod to go through the filter and come back out? And it's almost an imaginary number for me in flotation because you can run your circulation and get me theoretically four turnovers, but then when I shine my flashlight on the surface, there's still hairs floating around. So I know that not all that water got in there. So I just wanted to talk about the importance of skimming and whether that's, you should ask yourself in your pod, is the water actually being skimmed off? Because the, the dirtiest, the most infectious water in your pod is right on the, right on the surface there. And so that, that's got to get off somehow, either manually or through like some suction action of the filter in your pod. Um, and I just made a note here to say like, we, we kind of want what you want. You know, we want to tell the public, this is safe. You know, I, I've talked to many people who've asked this, is flotation safe? And they, they come in with this face that's like, mm, you know, it's gross. And then I'll say, no, no, I've, I've been to many of them. I've floated myself. They have filtration circulation. They have some sort of disinfection strategy. And you turn that frown upside down. They go, oh yeah, I'm going to try that. So you're doing that. I'm doing that. But if, if, we're, if we're both doing that and then, you know, they go and look at your water and there's hair floating around, I think that that's not helping either of us, right? So flotation, uh, I want to just, yeah, that, that bit about, uh, sorry, I'll go back. The bit about skimming and, and turnovers. I think that we should keep discussing that. Um, and I know that you know, entrapment isn't really a concern in my mind. The common sense would tell me that you're in there and there's no circulation going on, but the entrapment of swimmers and entanglement of hair in swimming pools is a big issue. But, um, I think there's an opportunity to speak to that with, with pods and cabins and things like that. I mean, what I would do if I was you is put, put the bather's feet at this end. That's one thing you can do to prevent their hair from getting caught. I think anytime you look at your pod after a floater's been in there, you should always look at your suction outlets and make sure that cover's in good repair and not broken or jagged so no one can get caught in it. Um, Emergency call buttons are great. I mean, you have all of these things you can do. There's almost like six or seven layers of protection you can build in, you know, to kind of meet the intent of what I would call that uh, VGB study and legislation. But what we ultimately want is, is safe water, and we talked about this in the workshop. And so all of these parameters you can tell me about, but they don't really mean a ton to me as a health inspector. Nothing on here really tells me. If, you, if you're keeping track of temperature and specific gravity and... Um, alkalinity, that doesn't tell me that no germs are going to grow. Even the presence of peroxide alone, you're probably running into a lot of pushback from health departments saying that's, that's not enough, that's not good enough. What we really want and what we love are like residuals and numbers. Um, and so I think we talked about in the workshop maybe the potential for measuring uh, millivolts. So in Alberta in our swimming pools, we've moved away from like telling operators to put a bunch of chlorine into the pool. What we'd rather you tell us is show us that you can um, keep your 
millivolts, uh, your, your oxidative reduction potential of the water high. And if you, you can, if you can do that, then I don't really care what disinfectant you're using, ORP rules. So if your ORP is high, you're gonna kill any germs that are in the, in the tank. But we're gonna need to talk about that because your water's a little different. I don't know how the salt's gonna match up with the probes. There's lots of work to be done there. Um, if you must use chlorine or bromine, potentially maybe you can ask to use less because again, in Alberta, 0.5 ppm is the minimum residual for swimming pools. That's really low. That's almost similar to drawing a bath for yourself. You're gonna probably pour that much chlorine into your, into your bathtub or have a shower in that much chlorine. So that's a really low level of chlorine and at the right pH, it's very effective at killing germs. And I think ultimately what you can do is uh, test water. And I know it depends where you're at, where you live, your access to labs and your labs capabilities, but proving that nothing's growing in the water is really valuable. Um, and then the horizons might be something like ozone. Uh, ozone, I don't see a lot of that in swimming pools, but ozone can kill germs and I've sh it's been shown to kill, you know, Pseudomonas and what we're worried about in, in float tanks in Edmonton. Um, but there's that indoor air quality concern. So be prepared for that discussion with your health department. Um, ultraviolet and peroxide together, I think is the, you know, on, uh, that on the horizon has such huge potential. But right now, what I, what I don't get when I inspect is, you know, there's no measurement of the transmittance of UV. So the intensity of that light killing the germs through the tube. Um, it's gonna cost a little bit of money. It's gonna you know, be a next generation thing, but we gotta know how much UV light is getting through that tube. Does the presence of a UV light doesn't mean it's working. And that you know, matched up with the presence of peroxide is gonna be, I think ultimately where you know, you're gonna be happiest if you don't wanna use chlorine. Uh, so again, just kind of moving through this peroxide and UV thing, um, just look for the summary of that discussion because we, we talked about it a lot, but if the health department's a little worried about peroxide and UV and that being some sort of carcinogenic activity, just remind them to go to their nearest strip mall uh, to the teeth whitening kiosk where they put that uh, peroxide gel on your teeth and then shine a UV light on you. It's the same technology, right? So um, that, that, that's gonna kind of be one of those real world examples that makes it seem a little less risky. And ozone, like I said, good potential to use ozone there. Um, I'm not like an, you know, by any means a chemist, uh, but at the same time, I, I think there's potential to kill germs, but that, it's just that air quality issue we gotta talk about. And Pseudomonas is, for, like I, I call that your target organism, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, if, you, uh, if you were at the workshop, you'll remember my, when I would lay there and say, what, it, what could infect me and, and <laughs> where it could get into me. Um, Pseudomonas I worry about a little bit, and so that's your target organism. I really think like chlorine does work, uh, but maybe you could use less. Uh, peroxide and UV, if there's potential there. Ozone is, as well, I think that would work. Um, and then uh, just borrowing from this um, study done at, at the float lab. You know, I don't think pseudomonas does very well in, in, the, uh, in the float water. You take float water out, you put some pseudomonas in there, and a day later you have a three log reduction, that's significant. And uh, I think we, you know, we're obviously gonna have to do more studies, but I think that that's very, very you know, uh, appealing to me as a health inspector. And keep in mind, if I get pseudomonas on me, do I fall over on the stage and die? Probably not. Um, we, again, pour pseudomonas into our bathtubs. We let it shower all over us this morning when you had a shower. There's, there's pseudomonas kind of all around us, so we can tolerate some. It's just how, do we let, let it grow? Do we let it set up shop? And, and that's really your, as an owner, your, your job is to make sure it's not. So what do I tell other health inspectors? I've got like a minute here, so sorry, I'll move quick. Um, I say don't use that old Alberta document, so none of you should be using it either, okay? Uh, I don't mean to do that, to cast dispersions, but let's get rid of that thing, because it's too old. Um, and don't copy, just because like the next door state or the next door province made a regulation, don't copy it, you know, make your own. Um, learn about what this industry is before you make a regulation. Um, go and do an inspection and understand each system specifically because everything's different. Your source water is different, the pods are different, the technology is different. And then if you're going to take a sample, make sure you take more than one. One sample tells you nothing. You have to look for a trend, okay? And you have to like read and you have to react to the different uh, results you get.
And this is what, I, what else I tell. And it was, this, is, this presentation is perfect timing considering what we just heard. We really should be, when you talk about the total thing about health, look, like there's just so much positive out there versus nothing negative. Like I can't find any sort of like outbreaks related to float tanks, yet we seem to think there's going to be one one day, right? So we have to keep this balance in mind. That's what I tell health inspectors. I hope you would agree. And with that, uh, that's my Twitter if you ever want to check me out. I tried to put a bird on it, but I couldn't. Um, and I think that's it. So I'll see you downstairs.